a little bit for everyone to uh, take a seat. We certainly have some seats left uh, in the front here. All right. Well, we'll get started. I just want to greet everyone. Uh, my name is Jason Napoli, and I am the Director of Employer Relations and Career Coaching in the Very Career Institute. And uh, one of the favorite parts of my job is to help uh, lead the Beta Omicron Distinguished Alumni Visitor Program. So this is our spring, uh, our spring residency. Uh, the Beta Omicron Distinguished Alumni Visitor Program was created by a very generous uh, gift by Lee Swanson from the class of 1960 and his wife, Jackie. Uh, Lee got some of his friends together um, who were all members of Beta Omicron uh, about 15 years ago or so uh, to put together a program to bring accomplished alumni back to campus for our students to learn from and with um, over a series of meals with students, classroom visits, uh, and a public lecture, which you're all here for today. Um, past uh, Beta Omicron Distinguished Alumni Visitors have included uh, Pulitzer Prize winning investigative journalist, a retired NASA astronaut, Disney executives, and other academics, uh, lawyers, business professionals, and artists. Uh, today's uh, and this week's uh, Beta Omicron Distinguished Alumni Visitor is Jeffrey McCune Jr. Uh, Jeffrey is the director of the Frederick Douglass Institute for African and African American Studies at the University of Rochester and also carries the title of the Frederick Douglass Professor of English. Uh, Jeffrey is the award winning uh, book, has the award winning book, Sexual Discretion, Black Masculinity and the Politics of Passing. Uh, he is also the co editor of Black Sexual Economies, Race and Sex in a, in a Culture of Capital. He is presently completing two book projects, Disobedient Reading, An Experiment in Seeing Black, and the other on the wildness of Kanye West, titled On Kanye. For his work at the intersections of race, gender, and sexuality, McCune has been featured on Left of Black, Sirius XM's Joe Madison Show, Huff Post Live, NPR, Pitchfork, and as a guest expert on the Bill Nye Saves the World. In July 2021 is when Jeffrey assumed the role of the director of the Frederick Douglass Institute at the University of Rochester. So without further ado, I want to welcome Jeffrey uh, to the podium to share some thoughts and his lecture entitled, Disobedient Things, Learning How to Read Again. Jeffrey. Good morning. So this is the thing, I'm back on the hilltop, I'm very excited, so let's get a good morning. It's truly my honor to return to the hilltop. I'm thankful uh, to all those who made uh, this visit possible, especially uh, Jason Napoli, Beta Omicron, um, Beta Omicron Distinguished Alumni Visitor Program, uh, students, faculty, and staff at Cornell College, all those folks who are alums here in the house, um, who have invited me back as a distinguished alum, I say thank you. So thank you, thank all of y'all um, for having me here. So before I start, I have to tell you that I've never knew why we had t-shirts that said, I went to the Cornell, not in Ithaca, until I have moved a distance away from Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. <laughs> Indeed, everyone who finds out that I went to Cornell College, they always ask me, the Cornell? And I go, yes, the Cornell in Mount Vernon, Iowa. So we are the first Cornell, for those who don't know. Uh, this is uh, the first Cornell. Okay. So now that it's settled, uh, let's move into the lecture at hand uh, entitled Disobedient Things, Learning How to Read Again. I'm certain most of you read this title and thought, reading is how I got to college. Why do I need to learn to read again? Isn't it true that once you learn to read that you're ready to go? Well, today's lecture wishes to take you on a reading journey traveling through moments of reading which may help us see differently to provide the framework or lens through which we can understand difference better. Today I wish to recruit each of you into an understanding that reading is never finished and for most who exist within the dominant group, rereading is necessary. As mostly everything is written 
as, as mostly everything is written with your read of things as most legitimate and most acceptable, even as that reading may stain the future, distort the past, and even confuse our present. For this reason, my ask today is for you to disobey the logics of standardized reading, to reject claims to knowledge which marginalize and manipulate, or rather do hurt and harm to extract through extraction and exclusion. Right now, I know this sounds a little bit like writerly extract, abstractions, but I want you to, to introduce you to my journey in reading. My first lesson in reading came when I was working on a seminar paper and Miss Jeffrey, who we might call a non-binary elder in black Chicago's LGBT community, offered an unexpected response to Aaron Douglas's classic mural painting titled Aspect of Negro Life from Slavery Through Reconstruction. I had described the painting to Miss Jeffrey as a composite of a panoply of black expression. I was an academic, so I was trying to be fancy. Demonstrating the many societal roles played by black folks in multiple historical periods. I showed Miss Jeffrey this image. His response, look at all those fierce queens dancing upon the earth, creating art and music in the time of pain and suffering. His reference to black queens here was striking, as it was a gesture towards his read of the image as containing men who performed the heightened femme and fierce performance of gender. I had learned this image as emblematic of black migration, which had canonically included a narrative of heterosexual black families moving with children and kin from southern oppression to northern opportunity. For Miss Jeffrey, black queerness was looking at him, hailing him in. It was not an add-on. It was already there. His reading of the photograph opened a space in history for subjects beyond the canon, which seems to take the image from the past into a black queer presence and future. It was clear that Miss Jeffrey, that for Miss Jeffrey, there was a refusal of the narrative of the painting or its caption. And instead, Miss Jeffrey disobediently read this image with his own set of knowledges and experiences. Here in this moment of Miss Jeffrey's reading, I had to rethink all the things that I thought I knew about the history that Douglas was carving through the artistic rendering as well as become open to the possibilities of other bodies and objects. Specifically, Miss Jeffrey's black queer eye was put to use, imagining the world beyond what he or I had been historically given. His move to read the image and in turn history was an experiment with seeing a dominant image with non-normative frames. Indeed, an experiment with seeing all things black. Miss Jeffrey's reading activated a black queer ocular which would guide my engagement with black text in collaboration with black queer studies, uh, studies um, in, in, in black studies which emerged to tell stories that were often resigned to closets, a world of discretion I narrated in my first book project. So what Miss Jeffrey offered me was a reading of Douglas and so many other queer mothers and fathers. And so, Part of what I wanted to make clear in this, this moment is this opportunity for me was an opportunity to reread what I had been given, right? I was given this image as the classic image. I mean, even my grandmother gave me this story, right? She's like, oh, baby, in 1931, we, we left Mississippi and we went to Chicago, right? But on her train, she never told me who was on the train with her. And Ms. Jeffrey gave me a vision of the multiple types of people that were on the train. And so one of the things that we've come to do is right, extract people from the history of the migration period based upon who we imagine them to be and largely based upon our dominant position. Ms. Jeffrey's radical disobedience to the ocular norms of reading history as given or reading bodies only as they historically were identified presented an occasion of new considerations for representations and real lived black life. Reading for me is a practice of looking with disobedience. 
So there's something that Miss Jeffrey misses in the radical inclusion of queens in the canonical ways in which visual regimes and visual offerings can also advance a radical exclusion. What I mean here is that all of these black queens excludes black cis hetero women and trans queens, black queer women, situating the fierceness in an ableist idea of mobility, the latter which was not available, like migration was not available to those people who could not actually travel, right? And so part of what Ms. Jeffrey misses, right, is also the inclusion of black cis women, black queer women, black trans folks, right, and also, right, folks who did not have the ability to travel. And so did my grandmother. She missed that too. So this is not to suggest that Miss Jeffrey's reading was not shared by some. For I recall my grandmother saying such things to me in the South as, as this. Everybody knew John Boyd was gay, little Jeffrey. John Boyd was a teenage kid who was a choir boy, apparently, who would leave Mississippi to pursue <clears throat> to pursue a career somewhere up north. This recognition is not just about identifying a queer subject in the South, but rather an important indicator that the black gaze of some Southern folks contended with what the dominant narrative was. My grandmother, Miss Jeffrey, intentionally told this their story to elaborate upon black migration in a way that produces new considerations of what family might have looked like, what types of folks worked, performed in the process of migration, including things like sex work and trade work, right? So we always think that, right, people came from Mississippi to Chicago, right, to do this respectable work. But sometimes some of the work that they were doing were work with their bodies, right? Sometimes some of the work that they were doing were not work that would be considered respectable by white society, right? There were other ways in which they did work, and part of what was important was to accommodate accommodate history for these truths. My grandmother, Miss Jeffrey, intentionally told their stories to elaborate upon migration. So while the move here clarifies what can be lost in the overall reading within a certain kind of canonical frame, the Douglas rendering of the story, it also clarifies what might be lost in the retelling. The ways in which readily disobedience can be an experiment in seeing black. For me, the most evocative and exciting discovery in my return to Miss Jeffrey's commitment to engage disobedience in the midst of a textbook image which acted as an authority is Miss Jeffrey's audacity to not only insert themselves into history, but to refuse what had been taught. And I have to say this. This was actually in 1999. I was a student at Cornell and I decided to go home into Chicago, and I decided to share my reading with my friends and with folks who meant something to me. And Miss Jeffrey was this elder who I really didn't know that well. My friend from Michigan State actually introduced us, and I was like, look, 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 look at this image, look at this image. And I was so excited to tell the story of migration the way that I had been taught in my um, Leslie Hankins African American um, literature course, to be surprised by this new reading, this disobedient reading. To read disobediently is to read against the history that one has been given, to pose challenges to what is excluded from the narratives we have grown to love and live with. For me, we have too long embraced the canon and accepted, accepted the stories that we have been told are true because of the authority of those who provided them. Because of this, it is no wonder that we sit in a moment where we still wrestle with news media. We still wrestle with social media to provide for us a narrative information which verifies and extends our often blind and myopic opinions of things, rather than accepting the bedrock of our learning as faulty. Our really tools are poor, and the primary way we keep seeing our society keeps us from moving forward and pushes a homogeneity 
that does not benefit anyone. To create a homogenous understanding of our story makes us feel better, even when we watch the harm that certain narrative telling does to those who have been made minority and who continue to be marginalized. For me, when we learn how to read better, we write richer stories, we write richer histories, a more complex present, and an able critical futures. The lecture today will largely speak to multiple audiences. It is a call for readers of many things. I want to suggest that the objects or figures for this analysis are also disobedient and unruly. So for me, it's not just people that are disobedient, right? Objects are disobedient. I'm gonna locate objects and figures who operate in disobedience and they lead us to places that we should have allowed ourselves to go a long time ago, but didn't feel like we had the permission to go there because of what we have been told was the authoritative narrative. Cowrie encounters another afterlife of slavery. October 2020, I would stumble upon a peculiar object as I walked through the Charles Wright African American History Museum in Detroit, Michigan. A cowrie shell found in Stagville, North Carolina. Unbeknownst to me, cowrie shells were once currency used to do trade between Europeans and Africans, a cowrie for African goods, and later was used to purchase Africans for labor. Essentially, the cowrie is most known as a participatory object in black enslavement and the theft of African goods. Yet my focus here refuses to rest at the point of black bodily exploitation and theft but turns to the cowrie shell's reemergence on slave ships and later plantations as adorning objects carried from coast to coast. Importantly, for the captive Africans, the cowrie was a symbol of wealth, honor, and style. Spirituality. Spiritually, these objects symbolized a strong connection to the spirit of the ocean and protection. The presence of cowrie shell across the Atlantic animates another usage of these objects as talisman, an object which speaks a history before captivity, the queer possibilities of pleasure, agency, and mindfulness. Upon this discovery, images of black queerness that began my sexual ex explorations speed into my frame, particularly how in 1990s and 19, the 1980s and the 1990s, black queer men and women would wear cowrie shells as fashion, as a telltale sign that they were in the family. From earrings to bracelets to hair beads, these folks paraded urban cities using the symbol of fashion as a sign of Afrocentric blackness, while also being a signal toward queer desire. I remember riding the L, the elevated train in Chicago, for those of y'all who don't know, headed up north, encountering cowrie after cowrie as I escaped the incarcerating logics of my south side Chicago Christendom. To the north side, we went to express outwardly and expressively our desire to one another, a doing of blackness and queerness together in ways that we were always pronounced, were not always pronounced in our south side homes or on our south side streets. For me, the cowrie shell was a symbol of black pride before I had ever gone to a pride parade or knew there was a large community of kin across the world. The cowrie shell, in its subtle beige and almost, and almost always tethered to leather bracelets or necklace pieces, reminded me that I had a tribe, folks who understood the distance between the south and the north as one that was liberating as it was lethargy producing. This object in my youth was a symbol of a rites of passage, passing from a space of black queer containment to black queer clarity and consciousness. The cowrie is a clarifying object of disobedience. This thing is more than currency or adornment, but perhaps 
a historical link between the past and the present. In his important essay, The Thing, Heidegger, and this is probably the only time you're gonna hear me quote Heidegger, but The Thing, Heidegger explains, the thingness of a thing remains concealed, forgotten. The nature of a thing never comes to light, that is. It never gets a hearing. The museum, the 1980s and 90s public transit riders, and the slave context gives us a hearing, renders a reading, and ushers us into disobedience. With this interpretive skill, we can read against historical facts and the overdetermining canon, moving towards something much, much more clear. Clear, queer, queer. Indeed, the cowrie is an object which enables us to, quote, hear things in all of their radical alterity and to apprehend the flesh that undergirds the historical construction of objecthood. These memories of black queer object wearing functions like an echo for me. When coupled with the history of power use, it is an affirmation of the queerness of and in slavery. It is a scene, yes, slavery is a scene of grave violence and cultural disconnection. While it is also a space where homoerotic connections between slaves were often deemed impossible. The Cowrie presence in the museum prompted a reading of the context of slave trade as one in conversation with queerness, not solely predicated on racial trauma and understanding. This piece of the archive, first witnessed on a black queer woman on the south side of Chicago, had to now be read as a queer artifact in the space of slave history and enslaved beings. In essence, the performance of Cowrie wearing in the contemporary was a practice of what I call the black queer ocular, a recognition of black queerness, regardless of archival evidence, which suggests its non-existence. And I want to pause here for a second just to say a little bit about what black queerness is for me, because I want to give folks an opportunity to understand that black queerness for me is not necessarily about LGBT presence, right? Black queerness for me is an admission of the outsiderness, right? of blackness from the start of its, of, of its processes within this, our country, right? So the position of queerness, right, the recognition of the cowrie shell, right, inside of the slave context is also an opportunity to remove the idea that slaves only, right, were enslaved, that they had no creative capacity, right, that they had no pleasure possibility that they had no love, that they had no eroticism, right? We've written that story over and over of slavery as a space of depravity. But we haven't talked about what did they take from coast to coast with them? What language was able to be spoken? What objects were able to be transported, unfortunately, on bodies enslaved? So part of what I'm trying to do is mark a space where black queerness can be expansive beyond just I'm a same gender loving person toward non-normative ways of being, non-dominant ways of being, an understanding of oneself where even the black family is itself queer in its inception as an idea. The unthought that is black queerness in slave ships, plantations, and history at large must be challenged. For me, the cowrie shell as a global black object acts disobediently, finding itself in all kinds of geographies, on all kinds of bodies. But particularly here, the cowrie shell's presence draws out and compels us to investigate and imagine a queerness at the site of slave ships and plantations. While I agree with Catherine McKittrick that we must understand plantation futures in terms of the how slavery shows up in our ideological and material present, I also think here we must begin to account for a future wherein we can recover items which bring us back to the place to which we cannot return, but also brings us to greater understandings of what actually has been missing from the annals of black history. But also, 
it is important to acknowledge what is present even as it is unremarked. I'm gonna fast forward in the sake of, for the sake of time. So almost a decade ago, Rashid Jordan offered a public lament when he penned Cultural Shock, How Straight Black Women Steal Black Gay Men's Language, a blog entry gone viral where he uses Bravo's hit show Real Housewives of Atlanta as a case study of how black gay men's language gets stolen in the popular. What's the team? You better read. Slay, Shade, are now all embedded in the vernacular of RHOA, Real Housewives of Atlanta. How many of y'all are Real Housewives folks? Got some, got some Real Housewives people good? They're, this vernacular is embedded in these TV shows. And like Darton, many have questioned the significance of this cha changing black lexicon, or at least its popularization, highlighting other shows as Fashion Queens and Empire and Star. Some have framed these utterances as violent borrowing, queer appropriations, or even gone so far as to call a cold war between black gay men and presumably straight women. Within the framing of these popular critiques is a suggestion that when black gay men and straight women coexist in space, black women occupy what is often called the fag hack position, while gay men occupy the space of some excessive agent as a good aesthetic assistant. Rather than continue to rely on this limited reading of the relationship, I would like to counter these canonical narratives of excessive and one-sided opportunistic kinship to move toward what we may see as critical collaborations between the two. While I do agree with the critique that gay men on Real Housewives of Atlanta are often used as accessory or, uh, and that um, many um, gay men utilize language that is inappropriate, misogynist, misogynoir, I agree with all of these claims, but I also want to challenge the idea that language is owned. Such claims pretends that black gay men and black straight women, and I can actually extend this to white gay men and white straight, uh, white, white straight women, right, did not emerge from similar communities or do not frequently occupy similar spaces wherein vernacular is co-produced. The critical omission allows room to make claims to language in a way that is both proprietary and, dare I say, convenient. It is this common assumption of stealing from the other which serves as the impetus for this, for this part of the talk and an explanation for my insistence that we must find new and nuanced ways to discuss shared vernacular. This particular collaboration between black films has a long history which sets a course a co-production of black gender performance which complicates what we have come to know as a quote unquote black film aesthetic. What I want to illuminate is partially how market commercial forces, right, create this kind of dualism, right, between uh, queer men and, and, and particularly cis straight women, or trans folks and cis people, right? It creates this kind of dualism, this fighting uh, over territory. And what I want to get us to is what might be gained from thinking about moments of collaboration. Moments where there is a kind of film collaboration uh, that people uh, uh, join together in performance. And one performance context is that of the jump rope. It was this canonical image taken from Kiragant's The Games Black Girls Play, Learning the Ropes from Double Dutch to Hip Hop, which prompted my excavation of what I call um, uh, collaborative kinship. While Gott was reading this jump rope scene as one of listening, listening on girls' daily broadcasts from the playground to illustrate the ways in which presumably masculine boys were present at the site of sonic production which preceded hip hop, I became most interested in how the reading changes if we, in fact, don't assume that the boy is a boy. Right, we know that at this age, right, gender is not verifiable by visual, right? We, we no more know that this child is a boy than we know that the girls are girls, 
right? I'm using your visual language, right? I'm using the language that we're familiar with, but I'm also trying to obscure this language, right? And so what happens when we think about this image as being something else, right? What happens if we think about, if we do accept that is a boy on the other side of the rope, right? If we think about this as a collaborative engagement, but if we don't accept that it's a boy in this image, but it is a person, a child, then the children are in fact engaging in the co-production of a black femme aesthetic, right? The fierceness of jump rope, the black femme fierceness of jump rope that would happen at the background of what we assume on the other side of the playground, at least I know on the other side of my playground, was a lot of boys and some girls playing football in, and, and doing other things that might be more, quote unquote, masculine identified or, or more dominant. So part of what I want to do here is allow us an opportunity to take this home place known as the jump rope and, and think about the collaborative kinship and, and between black queer boys and girls. Sharon Holland captures um, the kinship in this way. It recalls the impossibility of community with one another, mocking our ability to connect and also highlights the reciprocal nature of subjectivity or what it means to be a subject. As subjectivity is constituted not so much from belief in the self and one's own actions, but in the understanding of the other with whom we have a connection. I know it's a lot. While Holland's definition was not targeted towards the archive, which I'm engaging here, what she tries to point out is what is erotic about, or what is, what is collaborative about this jump rope space and beyond. Here at the site of finger snapping, feet stamping, and number counting, we find black girls and black queer boys conjuring rhythm, turning phrases, and gathering pleasures drawn from a corpus of experiences. These cross rhythms, as Gunn calls them, draws our attention toward the shared and creative language, both particular to the space as well as produced outside of it. Important here is the recognition that this soundscape, right, so part of what she's getting at is, right, the actual beat that the feet hitting the ground, right, it makes a rhythm, right, that commonly gets associated with the kind of urban sound in hip hop that we hear, right? We're like, all oh, right, we know what this, this sound is. Jay-Z draws from it, Beyonce draws from it, all these people draw from these sounds. But part of what I'm interested in is, is pushing back against the necessity to read this as a sonic experiment, right, but to understand this as a bodily experiment, right? What does it mean to actually begin to imagine what, what the significance of a moment of shared conviviality and friendship is, right? Part of what is, is problematic for me and why we want to disobediently read this image is because we want to carve a space where we're not always in tension as men and women, right? There were moments, right, where men and women, boys and girls, right, co-produced things together. And some of what they co-produced was not just antagonism, right? It's not boys have cooties and girls have cooties, right? That whole thing was not always the way in which we structured the, the world in which we live. This was a world of collaborative engagement. There had to be some two folks, two folks, right? I'm not gonna gender them right now. Two folks holding the rope, and some folks observing what was happening, and some other folks who were like, one or two or three or four or five, right? That had to happen, right? The jumps that happen often happen, you got this. Girl, you got this, you got this, come on. You got this, man, come on, you can jump higher than that. I got you, right? It was, it was not just competition. It was collaboration. And what was built in this space, I don't want us to forget. And there's a reason why I don't want us to forget. It. Not quite ready for the uh, clip yet, but. New Orleans bounce diva, Big Frida emerged in the underground New Orleans bounce music scene circa 1999, many years before the iconic voice would be featured on Beyonce's 2016 formation track. Big Frida, who identifies as a gender non-conforming, fluid, non-binary gay man, 
credits Katie Ridd, a drag queen balance performer, as informing their performance and style. Having performed as a background singer and dancer for Katie Red, I argue that the film fierceness that Big Frida would later own and now and use to become now the queen of bounce music was born in collaboration. Here I wish to suggest and discuss the use of Big Frida as the invocation for Beyonce, the use of a particular film sonic aesthetic in the sea of varying options offers us a moment to reflect on the potential of kinship which seems right for consumption. In many ways, Beyonce and Big Frida speak similar Southern languages, projected through film aesthetics and feminist vocabularies. Simultaneously, Big Frida, as the queer film subject, is used to do the dirty work, to spill the tea, to throw the shade. And we'll have the, have the clip now. We're almost there. We're not getting the visual image. Big freedom, not Jason Napoli. <laughs> If you can just play it, I, I, I have the image, so I'll go back to if you can play it while yeah. I'm... Fascinating. It's showing up right here. Okay. Uh, Many of you have seen this, right? You all know Beyonce formation, right? Um, so Big Frida opens Beyonce's show in 2016. I'm holding while they uh, figure out the technical difficulties, but Big Frida hosts this moment. Um, and part of what I'm trying to connect here, so while we're waiting on connection, beautiful. You'll see. Collaboration. So you all, how many of you heard the term slay before, right? Right. And so we all get to kind of like enjoy, right, what it means to slay, bitch, right? Um, and part of what Big Frida brings to us, right, is not only um, the joy involved in, and the fierceness involved in um, this performance, but she shows us, right, the way in which this vernacular might actually be outside of Beyonce's normative lexicon. And she utilizes the queer voice to do the work of what may be called the ratchet or disrespectful for Beyonce. But it may also be said that Big Frida and Beyonce will be doing this together before this moment of collaboration, of musical collaboration. That if we look back at the scene of Double Dutch, right, that there could have been a Big Frida and a Beyonce doing this work. Right? So the, the traditional reading would be to say, right, these two could not have done this work together in a previous moment. Well, what I'm trying to show us, right, this is a way in which there's a shared lexicon, a shared vocabulary, and a shared possibility of gender, even equality between two folks that existed in earlier moments, that somehow we lose it in this kind of capital consumption of media and this gross kind of um, separation of genders through media. So for me, the collaboration of, of, of gender 
does not actually have an origin story. So the shared grammars, aesthetics, and vocabularies that Bay and Big Frida share anticipates later collaborations of Beyonce with other film sources of disobedience. And so how many of y'all have seen Renaissance? Her newest, her newest work, Beyonce? Renaissance? You have not listened to Renaissance? Oh, this is a first. This is a, thank you. <laughs> you know, um, nobody know Cuffit? Yes. Uh, okay, okay. Somebody said yes. <laughs> um, so, in a world where black queer femme trans bodies are often under attack, Beyonce's Renaissance allows us to see not only the value of these bodies and voices, but their centrality in making black music and black life and culture. It brings back the lost knowledge of the role of disco in the world of black gender non-performing artists like Sylvester. Anybody know Sylvester? Couple, thank you. R&B greats like the queer Luther Vandross. Okay. And even augments our historiography of rap, drawing on a genealogy of so many unnamed singers, writers, dancers, and musicians who may be lost in the canon which only recognizes what we can see. Indeed, what I wish to do here is what Miss Jeffrey did for me, and name other ways that we can read black life and culture which honors and recognizes those who have always refused to be swallowed in the normative scope, teaching us to have a different, more dynamic vision and version of black worlds. Uh, that's not where I was. <laughs> There we go. All right. So today we've traveled on my reading of multiple objects. And I will land today on one final object this afternoon, and that is you. Well, not all of you. But you who reside in a dominant positionality, who occupies a space of privilege, and who has access to worlds that so many suffer from. Disobedience for you can literally make for a world of difference. What would it mean if those who often read themselves as ancestors of abolitionists, those who fought to free slaves to know a world where all were free, right, really began to read more honestly their participation in anti-blackness and slavery? What would it mean to presume that the racist DNA, the tendency to see the self before the other or better than the other, to understand that that prevails in our practices of workplace, college, and beyond? What would it mean to disobey the status quo, moving as if there were more people in your world who occupy marginal positions? What would it mean to actually think of a Cornell College that was 70% black and brown? What would it mean to run a college institution with the idea that it is wedded to values that would serve its 60-70% black and brown student population? What would it mean to be so disobedient? What would it mean to literally read beyond the books that you've been given but to immerse yourself in readerly practices that engage the books I dare say have been banned to keep us limited and to narrow the scope of our diverse and dynamic world? What would it mean for you to wrestle with the easy narratives your parents and grandparents gave you to imagine the world where those you love have lived much of their lives in privilege and none reflective about those privileges? sharing with none, and obscuring these privileges as something that happens naturally and not in the constructed conditions of our world. What does it mean to look at some of the objects and figures of your history, to note that even folks like Thomas Jefferson found themselves always engaged in a practice of devaluing the contributions of black and brown people in this country? What does it mean to ask, like Frederick Douglass, a modified question, what is the 4th of July to black folks who labor in a world 
that continues to label them, kill them, and reject them in the name of God, law, and liberty. I dare you, as objects, to move more disobediently, to mark yourself different, to begin again. I dare you to allow the things of our lives and our histories to take you on a journey where you read more deeply, where you read better toward a brighter future for us all. Thank you. So we have about 12 minutes for Q&A questions about some of the things you heard, some of the things you saw. Um, I'm really delighted to take questions. I'm gonna come behind, from behind this, this podium um, and move outward. Um, but questions, comments, thoughts, things that got you titillated. Places of departure. <laughs> Yes, my friend. Is there a way to get a mic? Oh, take that reason for me. I just wanted to say I loved your talk. It was such a brilliant evocation of kind of the hidden histories that we forward into light. And it was such an interesting way of rereading the Great Migration um, in a disobedient manner. So I loved, I loved that. Thank you for bringing that, that forward. Question, comments? Because I know that whoever asks the question, they have to have the mic. So I'll try to project as much as possible. Um, I have a quick talking point for Corey and Jeffrey, if, uh, about people taking questions. Um, can, can you share a little bit more, um, you know, particularly for the students um, here, about how your Cornell experience impacted your later studies and your, your, your graduate pursuits and your professional pursuits? Absolutely. Yeah. So that's, that's, a, that's a really, really loaded question. Thank you, uh, Jason, for that. And also, um, one that I hopefully I can pivot to answer in a way that um, is honest to this talk, right? So part of what I think is really difficult when you come to college, right, is that you come here with a set of tenants that the folks who sent you here paid for. Right, whether you went to private school, public school, right? They did some work to make sure that you held on to the quote unquote principles that they gave you. And many of us, you know, my parents are watching, I know, and I can say this, right? Our parents didn't know better. They knew some things, but they didn't know better, right? And so they sent us here to college thinking that we were gonna come here to start a career and sometimes they realize that we actually learn radical disobedience in college. And so one of the things that I learned very early on was Cornell was gonna be a place for me to act out, to actually push the things that I had been taught, to actually push against things that I had, 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 had um, learned to value, right? When I, when I came to Cornell, I would call myself both a misogynist and a homophobe, right? And those weren't values that necessarily my parents would say they instilled in me, but they are values that I think came with a certain kind of brand of Christianity that was much wedded to a uh, kind of uh, literal interpretation, actually not literal, actually, now that I, I've actually studied and gone to seminary a little bit, I know they ain't even liberal, liberal right? It's, it's kind of a liberal interpretation of, 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 of scripture. Right? But I didn't realize that then. I was just going with what I learned in the church. And so when I got to Cornell and I met people, actually talked to people who were like me and different from me, it was our mission. Like, I remember we used to say things like, find someone who is different from you. Right? Have conversations, not to tokenize them, but actually to have genuine interest in, like, where are you from? That's why when I, every student I met today, I said, where are you from, right? What's your name, right? 
because I want to know your name and story. And if I'm in college with you, I want to know more than your name and story, right? I want to get to know you and know your ins and outs and know why you believe what you believe. And I even want to have dialogue with you so that we can actually exchange ideas that will help us both grow. And so one of the things that Cornell did for me was it allowed opportunities in those three and a half week courses, right, for us to really intensely engage in intimate ways, right? I don't know if y'all still do nine to 12 and one to four or something like that, right? Pretty much, right? You know, we're together every day for five days, three weeks, three and a half weeks. And it pushed me to like stretch Stretch, stretch my, my, my beliefs, but also stretch my capacity. Because I think one of the things that we don't realize is that we actually have the capacity to be disobedient in ways that our parents may not have, our grandparents may not have had that wheel. They have the way. Don't get fooled. Right? Slaves could have chosen not, slave masters could have chosen not to be slave masters. Right? They could have chosen Right? But the wheel wasn't there because it was more compelling, there was more incentive to own slaves than to not. And so it took some real internal work, right? So it takes some real incentive for those of us who, who occupy dominant positions in whatever way you do, whether you're masculine identifying, whether you're white, whether you're um, uh, a, 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 a Christian, whether you are um, able-bodied, right? You hold in you some prejudice, right? You hold within you things that you need to expel. And I hope that you will take this as an invitation. Like I said, I'm recruiting you, right? Recruiting you into a life of disobedience because it's better for everybody. It's better for your children. It's better for if you have children, you want children. If you don't want children, it's better for people around you, right? And you don't have to think about children. I think sometimes centering children is actually also a ruse. Right? It's, it's about what life do you want to have here? Right? What world do you want to produce? Yeah. Questions? Any other questions? Don't be shy. You only got me for five more minutes, I promise you. So if you have a question, your opportunity will leave in like about four minutes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, there's so many ways I can go with the conscious disobedience. I think, so there's two things here. Um, this talk, right, takes the position that so much of who we are is what we are reading. And it's not just about reading what we're reading in terms of books, it's also the narrow ways in which we are reading. For example, Right, folks want to talk about hip hop, but they don't know nothing about urban life. Right, folks want access to like the N word, but they don't actually understand what the N word is, its history, where it comes from, why it is important, right, to the lexicon of black people, and why it's also not important. Right, but they also don't understand why it's important to the lexicon of white folks. And it's not isolated to the rural South or to the rural Iowa, right? I hear it at concerts. When I was at the Migos concert, I saw more white people using the N word than ever. I almost left, right? And so I have to operate in disobedience a lot of times when I am faced with something that I have taken as a given, right? And then someone else tells me, ah, that's actually not the way to see the world. So for example, what's a given is that the N-word is just, as my best friend once told me um, here at Cornell, the N-word is just a, a word. And rappers use it, and it, it, it makes the music. That's what he said. Right? And so I had to push him to disobediently read that. I was like, 
Well, if it makes the music, take it out and tell me what happens to the music. He tried it. He's like, okay. I said, so, so, so put brother where the N word is. Does it change? No, it's a double syllable, right? So if you really want to be true to it, and you want me as your black best friend, right? Then disobediently move. Now you asked about me, you said about me, so I'll give you me. Um, part of what I think happens for me, my readerly disobedience is a little bit more layered. Right, so for example, I'll give you how I came to this moment of, of disobedient reading. So when Miss Jeffrey gives me that, that rereading of the image, Miss Jeffrey takes me to a place that I could have rejected. I could have literally said to Miss Jeffrey, you're not in college. You didn't even go to college. How can you tell me what the migration is? Right? And so not only did it teach me how to read that image, but it taught me how to have grace with people. To know that knowledge production is not just one that intellectuals do, that academics do, right? But that knowledge production is what my grandmother does, right? Knowledge production is what Miss Jeffrey did, and that you don't have to be a cis straight person to give me the knowledge about black folks and family, right? There's a whole other archive that we have access to, right? Like, and we love it now, right? How many of y'all know about bold culture and ballroom, right? How many watch Pose, right? So everybody's like watching this new familial structure, right? That has existed for decades in the black community, right? But now it's a media and folks are like, wow, they really take care of each other. Oh my God, I can't believe it. She actually took them to the clinic. Oh, she took him, she, she made sure he had food. She was like a, a, a surrogate mother. What is this family structure I'm learning about? That is how black folks have been doing it for decades. And so disobediently, we have to read, right? Because we talk about dysfunctional black family. But to disobediently read is to actually say, no, 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 no. They're multiple functioning, right? Multifunctional black family might be what we need to be saying. Right? There's multiple functions for the family, and they don't all look alike. Right? Um, and last thing I'll say is, this is actually, I was teaching a black masculinities class, and we were reading this book. I had just had this idea, you know, um, I grew up with a, a, a father who, you know, went in and out, right? And so the, the author was talking about um, black fathers are present in different ways. And I was like, but if they're not in the home, how are they present? How, do you, how can you be present if you're not in the home? Well, the way that capitalism works, right, is that fathers sometimes feel like they have to work two jobs. And so you know how he showed up. When the teachers reported, they did a study of teachers, when the teachers reported how do black men show up, they talked about every day seeing these brothers walk their kids to school, right? Pick them up from school. When the teacher parent conference came, they showed up and they said, do you hear my son, do you hear my daughter? Listen to my son and daughter. And they, they mapped all this, right? But these are the same men that when the reports came out from the school, they said, yes, most of our, um, our homes are single mother homes. And it wasn't true. It's just, what is your construction of home? And this is not to say that we don't have difficulties across cultures, actually, across races, with men's participation in the domestic sphere. We have that problem. That's called misogyny. But I do think it's important to recognize these moments, right, where our normative narratives are just limited. Okay, I think we have one more. I'll take one more. I know I gotta go, but I'll walk to you. How about that? <laughs> so I'm not sure what types of groups you've given this talk to, but is there a way that you curate it according to the group that you are presenting to? 
because right now you're in a, a group of liberal arts college students who are going to be probably a little more open to your talk as you know, another group might be. Yeah. So the question was, you know, you give this talk a lot. I give multiple talks, so like this this talk. You know, I had a technical issue this morning, so some of my talk, you know, didn't didn't kind of come come out. So that's sad. But hey, you do what you do. But um, yes, I think every talk is designed particular to an audience. Um, and I definitely have given this talk. So last week I gave a similarish talk at the Rochester Public Library, right? And this particular group was interested in the shoulders on which we stand. And this was a historic group of mostly white, gay, and lesbian, and trans folk who were interested in what are the shoulders on which we stand? Can you talk about that? And you know, the, the typical talk might be like, let me talk about Bill Rustin, let's talk about Jenna, let's talk about Hodge Lord, let's, right, right, I could have done that. But I actually wanted to press my white LGBTQIA folks and family that you also host anti-blackness, massage noir, right, ableism, and that when you look at the way in which you've told the story, you're not attending to the multiple players in the story. And this is what happens when you do not include. So now we're picking up pieces and you want me to tell you whose shoulders you're standing on, but the archive doesn't have the pictures of those people. The artifacts, the objects, right, are missing, right, because no one was chronicling, right, the many black lesbian women who helped men who were suffering from AIDS in the 1990s, right? The archive doesn't include them, right? The archive doesn't include how drag performance actually interrupted the political sphere in this country, which is why it's under attack today. It does not include it. It also does not include the way in which right, black, queer, trans folks have been doing gospel performances to kind of append this idea that gospel and Christianity belongs to one particular body, one particular person. That is also what's under attack in Tennessee and Arkansas and, all, and, and, and I don't know, Iowa maybe too, but you know, all of them, right? So what we're not talking about is really what are, right, the things that we're losing. And so that audience, I, I tailored that conversation to them. So yes, I have to table the conversation. I will tell you this, y'all are a liberal arts, academic, intellectual uh, community, and so I kept some of the $3 words in, but for other conversations, I, I'm, I, I, I come off the mic and I'm just like, let me tell you about this piece. What up? <laughs> Let's talk about this piece. What up? Right? I can do that too, but sometimes I want to be clear to my words. Right? I want to actually hit the, hit the, hit the beat and hit the point. So thank you for that question. And thank each of you all for being with me today. Um, it is an honor. Thanks to the Owls for having me. Um, and thank you for everybody, the work that you're doing to transform this community. I know Cornell is a better place because you're here. Continue to, to move with disobedience. I'll see you soon.